Key. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone has had a wonderful day. Okay, welcome to this thing which we call Shoe. Um, so I've got up on the chat board, as per usual, the Hey there! If you have a one page comic idea, that you can sum it up in one or two sentences. Lay it on me. Gently. And uh, we'll do what we can. Let's see if we can figure that out. So, hold on. i got to turn this down. Today's music of choice is Black Sabbath. Let's listen to a little bit of old rat salad. But uh, Fairies with Boots is a little loud. So, anyhow. Here's yesterday's page. Courtney saves the day. This is uh, an alternate timeline riff. Uh, I put in the description of this piece on... Uh, Instagram and the face of books uh, talking about how, you know, if time is a constant, therefore we cannot alter time. Da, 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 da. But in order to make everybody happy, sometimes you have to. Or do you? <laughs> it's all there in the description. Take a look, give it a like. Da, 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 da. Having a sip of my gentle little cup of coffee. Get myself juiced up for this. I've had a rough night. We're going to have a wonderful morning. Anyways. Uh, okay, so here's yesterday's page. Courtney Saves a Day. Suggested by Jim Luan. Um, if you get an opportunity, please check out uh, Jim's uh, Jim's YouTube page. It's fantastic. Full of some brilliant animations. There we go. How are you doing, Didi? Uh-oh. Didi's, Didi's already seen it. Oh, we're going to do the whole fish idea, Didi. The whole fish in its entirety. It's they make it in its entirety. There we go. Yeah, I got an angle on it. I was thinking up. Uh, okay, so sorry, here's yesterday's page. And uh day before that. And then now we've got uh old Courtney. Courtney Love saves JFK. So this was a fun one to do. Uh oh, Gary's joined us. How you doing, Gary? Welcome aboard. I'm gonna star uh you're doing my whole fish idea because that's fun. Okay, the uh, original pages to make this page are uh, I drew this in uh, marker, just a felt tip marker, and uh, this as well. Decided to omit the purple around it, and this is just standard pencil crayon, and the rest of it's just uh, modifying, uh, modifying uh, state images and. Assembling it all together. I think that I would have chosen, and if I was to go back for print, I uh, I will choose a different typeface for this. And just go over and do the typeface again because uh, I find it's a little blurry on the end result, but that's okay. There's a couple things that I have notes on to go back and and redo a little bit, like the the Werner Herzog page that I did. I want to go in and um put some white highlighting to that. It's just pretty, I, as much as I was trying to just do a flat page in, in hindsight, it's too flat. So yeah, here's something that's uh, rattled Gary's cage. <laughs> that's gets a star. Good afternoon, Philip. Welcome aboard. Didi saw Black Sabbath in concert. Huh? The secret Didi. Probably not so secret. Probably not so secret to those that, uh, that oh, here's, now here's a, this is a Gary response, if I've ever heard one. I am fascinated and delighted. <laughs> yeah, that, that fits. That really, truly does fit. It's, uh, it's one of those, the, the, Didi's like an onion. She's got layers. Speaking of layers, I'm enjoying working on Photoshop. Eh? Okay. Segway. All right. So today's page is listed at the top. Uh, hey, here's some fun news. I went to an event last night that I truly, truly enjoyed. It was a meet and greet for uh, London artists and writers and, and dancers and photographers and creative types. It's uh, It was a really cool thing for me. And uh, I, I got to talk with a bunch of people, and um, I'm putting together a, uh, I've been asked to do a, a workshop at the Big Words Festival here in London this year. So that's exciting. 
uh, all those 70 bands. <laughs> Holy cow, Didi. That's a lot of concerts. What else was what else was involved? I would keep to myself. <laughs> Star. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Didi Willingham. Yeah, it's fantastic. The Secret History of Didi Willingham. It sounds to me like a that's not a one page. That's a book. We gotta, we gotta get a hold of Hubster and find out what he knows. We gotta get all the, the hot goss from Didi's Hubster. Yeah, that's good stuff. Ah, there we go. That's a little better. Okay, so uh the idea for today's page is from Didi. Black Sabbath loving Didi. Black Sabbath attending Didi. Didi, when you saw them, was it Ozzy or was it Dio? That's an important thing. That's an important thing. Um because I'm Dio, or I'm, I'm not Dio Sabbath. I'm Ozzy Sabbath, right? Uh, right when they really had their jazz roots on their sleeve, you know? So. <laughs> there we go. Hold on, where is that? <laughs> See, there's the testimonial there, everybody, that's tuned into this. Dee Dee doesn't remember if the Sabbath country she saw had Ozzy or Dio. And with that statement involved, I refer back to this one. What else was involved? I keep to myself. There we go. We've got it all rounded up. <laughs> Dee. I hope you're blushing. I hope you're blushing in Atlanta. All right. So uh, we've all found out the secret truths of Dee. Would have been 71, 72. That sounds like Gazi. Good Sabbath. Great Sabbath. Amazing Sabbath. I just, I'm not a Dio guy. Never was. Something about the way that the uh, the the band, more so than the singer, was really fused tight and really into those uh, little little jazz plays, like in Fairies with Boots and and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, who's this? Look out! It's Frank. Everybody, Frank. I need a. I'm gonna set up an audio file on here so when Frank pops in, it just goes Frank. Like Norm, it'd be great. You have to get a bunch of people to send me recordings of themselves just saying, Frank. Okay, today's idea is whole fish on a pizza from Didi. Uh, yesterday's was Courtney, say, or Courtney Love saves uh, JFK from being assassinated. And uh, yeah, that was a fun one. I, uh, I, I only call her inebri the inebriate agent. And uh, because, uh, you know, that's as I do. But like I said, I'm going to go back to that page and change the text before I would ever put that to print. Just a couple, there's three pages now I want to do alterations to, and I've made notes. I have little notes. That's my note making. So, yeah, uh, I had a similar experience, I think, to how Gary felt after the, uh, the art festival that he attended on the weekend. Um, I had a... Uh, I had a similar feeling last night to this uh, to this art meet and greet that I went, where it, wow, there's other people out there, and we can engage in stuff, and and fantastic sharing of ideas, and fantastic sharing of upcoming events, and celebration of who are you, how are you, you survived COVID, how's things, you know? And it was really nice. It was really nice. Made some connections with some people that I haven't had a chance to connect with in a while. And uh, I got some exciting things to look uh, forward to throughout the year. A uh, possible book project with a, a really, really uh, strong playwright here in the city. And uh, that we're, we talked about doing something together. And it's kind of like it sort of had to happen after, you know, roughly 25 years, 20 years of knowing each other. So, yeah, good things all around. Okay, so today's idea is uh, whole fish on a pizza. So I... Uh, in the conception of whole fish on a pizza, to me, I still have managed to keep nails, everybody. I'm doing good. Um, I trimmed them. I cleaned them up a little bit because I was scratching myself senseless. But I still got them. I cleaned them up with the sanding thing this time. No, 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 no more of that. My idea here is, uh, now I'm not sure what culture and what commonality in certain places feel towards the idea of a whole fish on a pizza. I don't, there's gotta be some place on earth where some sort of fabricated pizza type surface is 
got an entire fish dropped on top of it. Hey, you know, like that's a, that's a real deal. If anybody's aware of that, please let me know. So, but with such a, an abstract idea for today's page, um, Emery board. Thank you, Didi. It's an Emery board that I used. Sandy thing. <laughs> Sandy thingy. <laughs> yep. Um, with so I, uh, I got a whole bunch of them. Look at them all. Look at I'm ready to go. Ready to keep my nails. It's for modeling. Anyways, um, so with that idea, uh, I thought that I would have your over the top reaction to the idea of an entire fish on a pizza be the, the, the prominent story point. And, uh, and what I mean by that is uh, it, you got to find an angle. Like yesterday's angle, when you have to get a manicure to draw on camera, use emery boards. That's right, Frank. Frank is my fashion and stylistic consultant. Also, don't spit. Don't spit on the floor when you're doing the live stream. Thank you, Frank. Um, <laughs> Uh, so my idea is when I approach any single one-page comic or in, in any execution of any art piece specifically, there's two ways that we can go about uh, coming at those things. One is to say, well, I'm just engaged in it. I'm just going through the processes of how I know this, this material works with this material, with this surface, etc. And then you see what sort of takes shape. That's one conception. and But that's a harder thing to do when you're writing and illustrating stories, you need to have some sort of notion, some way of opening that door up to the process uh, that you need to enact for you to finish the page. And for me, it's generally, here's an idea and off I go. But what, I, what, what the second part of that connection is, somebody says, hey, here's an idea, even if it's something as abstract as whole fish on a pizza. <laughs> Stop it! And uh, I mean, that just leaves a wide door open. I mean, the whole thing can, you, you could just, you could do a comic talk, with just a, a single flat image comic of just a pizza with a fish slapped on top of it and all kinds of text around it, either arguing against it or justifying it. I mean, that's, you could do something as basic as that. Because the idea here to, is the fusion of visual and textual, right? And we need to have those two things together, you know? And, uh, the, the idea of that to take it to 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 the next level of storytelling is uh, we have to have an angle or a concept or a, some something to swing at you know uh, and for me I'm going to have a reaction to the idea of a whole fish on a pizza and so the idea with that for me is uh, that it, to certain people let's say of uh, from a country that's shaped like a boot. They don't like this idea. What are you doing with the fish on a pizza? So we're going to explore that. And the second approach I want to think about is how do I just step right into it? Because presenting the idea, yesterday's idea was presenting an idea from an origin point. Here's JFK. Here's the grassy knoll. Here's the crowd of people. You know, here's the, the time agent or the inebriate agent an inebriated time agent shows up and then stops the actual assassination and then there's a summation to it um so with that in mind right that that's a very narrative origin point to conclusion storytelling style as uh, what we're going to do here though because this one is going to be a little more conversational i'm going to take my uh my wrist thing off Bear with me today, folks. I, uh, I had a I had a moment last night. So I, I did not mix uh, make for a happy night after after I came home for the event and I was tired. I really should have gotten lying down. I didn't. I ended up having a seizure. So if I'm a little sweaty today, many apologies. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus instead on the reaction of the introduction of the concept of uh, whole fish on a pizza. I'm missing all kinds of things, and I apologize for that. 
The fish has a whole pineapple in its mouth. Slow down, Dee Dee. <laughs> That's it is fun. We'll put a pineapple on the tray with it. How's that? Frank is actually conceiving the way to go about making this fish on a pizza. Please don't do it, Frank. There's something inside me that says this is a bad idea. Nope, they are not, but that's okay, Frank. Thank you for your concern. A luau. Is that luau? Is that what that is? All right, so if I, if I draw the reaction from the waiter, let's start there. And, uh, and then, of course, I'm going to go into some stereotypes a little bit because the idea is selling the notion as fast as I can. And the easiest way to sell a notion of the upset Italian guys is to use <clears throat> is to use some recognizable prominent Italian guys. So I think I might be putting some of, uh, I don't know, like the Sopranos in this page or something of the like. So uh, I'm putting together the the waiter. I want him to be, what are you talking about? Kind of a face, kind of an expression. There's uh, probably only one conceit. Going back to the getting manicures for, for drawing on camera, there's uh, the comment from Frank. I think there's probably only one um, conceit that I might have um about being in camera and that is not trying desperately on some conscious subconscious level not to make the faces of the characters i'm drawing because it's a real thing that uh that artists will do and if you if you ever ever have an opportunity to just spend some time in a studio with another artist eventually you're going to look over at them and they'll be doing this or so as they're drawing, as they're painting, as they're, they're doing whatever, some kind of visual, you know, some kind of a visual creative process of a person's face sculpting, whatever it is, you don't, a lot of times artists will make the expressions of the people that they're drawing because it's all, it's like that sympathetic magic, you know, it's, uh, it, it assists, it assists in, you know, how do the muscles move in the face? And or uh, I, I saw this before. I showed a, a, a studio with a number of people many years ago, and uh, one of the people was putting Mick Jagger in something. It was uh, he's putting all kinds of cool, cool musicians in his this this illustrations of him around. Basically, he built a church that was. Uh, a church of the record player kind of a thing and uh and so as he's doing some illustrative work of rock guys that he loves as he's drawing um mick jagger just laying it out for him to to, to uh, rough penciling so that he can go into this this painting he's standing like he's got the arm tucked under the under the elbow or under the the ribs here and he's as he's drawing <laughs> He's got this kind of a movement to him. And uh, it was fantastic. We, uh, a couple of us just stopped and watched him. Just stopped and appreciated it. You got to appreciate those special moments. All right, big old mustachio. So hopefully, now again, the camera... One of my sons is going to sit down with me and uh, we're going to build a rig uh, uh, around the desk so that uh, I can have a, a much better, uh, much better placement and much better uh, quality towards the camera that I'm, I'm using. So it's going to help, uh, help me out with that. All right, so I'm drawing perplexed, perplexed waiter at this point. I'll pull that up. Frank has said it's really awkward when you're drawing love scenes. Oh, for God's sakes, Frank! I, and I'm not like a silly person. I walk through that and read it out loud. 
Frank says it's... <laughs> Which is why Frank now draws alone. <laughs> Does that make it less awkward, Frank, or more awkward for everyone involved? Is aware of that. Frank's ideas are at times like a, a little noodle, a little virus in your ear. He's like a virus. I'll drop something on you and you don't realize what it is at first. So my the second in, intent with the characters that are going to be in the composition is I want a lot of this. I want a lot of these hand movements. Uh, I think that uh, something like that is, is almost essential in you know it's a cultural aesthetic it's hey how you doing hey you know it's cliche yes to some extent if anybody that's watching has further insights for me into their proud italian heritage that they would presuppose that i would do in a different way my intent's not to be insulting but i find that breaking things down often into almost the expected norm, not so much as a stereotype, but the expected norm for representation of culture, representation of individuals. It, uh, it just allows a more broad audience to immediately free associate to the visual element. You know, and that can be challenging because at the same time you don't want to do something that's just opaque you know grossly opaque and what i mean by that is something that just there's no imagination to it at all it's like when you watch b movies and they've got uh, gangster guys in them and or low income you know the the director is the is the writer is the producer is the star those kinds of films and uh I'm th it's the Italian tough guy, and it's like, hmm. oftentimes those those portrayals are more of just a generalization as opposed to you know anything uh, interesting and unique. So uh, throwing this down in pencils, doing a little bit of traditional work today. I, uh, despite uh, not feeling great today, I have managed to hit my productivity rate. I've got, uh, I would, I, I'm still aiming objectively for the 50 pages. Uh, uh, I'm actually at 49 because I've assembled some things that uh, I'm assembling more pages now than I. Uh, I'm able to showcase because, you know, I post one a day. So that's, it's going well. I'm feeling good. Yeah. So, uh, the predominant image that's going to be on this page is of course, it's going to be the pizza itself with an entire fish on it. I actually like drawing fish. It's a weird, I know that's a kind of a, oh, that's great, Chris. You know, there's just something about, and I mean, I'm not talking about, oh, like thin back shirts and all different kinds. And No, I, I just, it's little, small, you know, stereotypical fish. It's fun. <laughs> Frank, what was the last page that you suggested? I just did one for you. Did you see it? Oh, the monster one, Frank. Did you see that page? Pick one or the other, Frank, Dini says. Nap or make fish? Fish pizza. I'm still surprised by things like fish tacos. What?
the the Brady Bunch page. Yes, I'm glad you saw that, Frank. Didi says that was a good page. Thank you very much, Didi. Yeah, I had fun doing that. It's um, that was another case of uh, playing with the approach, right? Because with the with the uh, the setup with with the setup that it's it's got to conform to the Brady Bunch open. I wanted to do it, come at it a different way. I didn't want to do that, 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 that then do the song. I wanted to uh, explore that dynamic, but do so with uh, by describing visually the monsters, but describing texturally a really dark assessment of the characters of the show. Diddy likes fishing. She likes to fish while she listens to Black Sabbath on her headphones. And their headphones from the 1980s, that thin little wire frame that goes around the tiny little foam earpieces. Old school. Frank likes fish, everybody. I want to draw Dee Dee at a, a Black, Black Sabbath outfit now. <laughs> I'm going to put you on a page, Dee Dee. So this is my big Italian waiter's incredulous response to, I guess if response of incredulity would be more, more appropriate grammatically, but <laughs> I, uh, I like that. I, uh, I never wear black TV. I'm always dressed in bright sun, sun, sunny rainbow colors and whites and no. Blacks and grays, if I can get away with it. Blacks, my wife buys me clothes that have color in them. She, she sneaks them in there. Yeah, she knows I like things like drab. My favorite colors, uh, like a drab green, like a military green is my favorite color. I just, you know. Uh, uh, Frank likes to listen to Barry Manilow on the old eight track. Nicely done, Frank. Does it have the -ching, -ching sound when it goes from song to song? Because that's the only way to do that. You haven't lived until you tried to listen to a record on or a, an album on eight track and eight track only. Yeah, olive green, like a drab green. That's my favorite color. Just, you know, I don't know what that says about me, but what's your color choices say about you? Drab green is your favorite color. You're probably a lunatic. If you like pink, you like sunshine and rainbows. Don't be like Billy. Choose the sunshine. Camo green. Is there such a thing as a camo green? See, when I think of camo, I think of multiple colors. I don't think of a singular one. A Canadian military, that's right where you have one. Their, all their stuff is painted in that drab green color. Fun little things I think about often when I'm drawing a person's sleeve is that along that seam, along that hem, on a, a collar is always that little bit of bunching and uh 
you know, I always try to make sure I get that in there as I'm drawing clothing. It's uh, it's one of those little things that I always make sure I do. Didi says she grew up in the military and she married the military. Oh my goodness. You would be very familiar with that color. At least one time in the course of your marriage, have you been surprised by your husband who's standing in the same room, but you couldn't see him because of the camouflage? Sometimes I wear camouflage hats so that nobody can read my thoughts. It just looks like I don't have a head. I could do this all day. It's terrible. All right, so here is my full-bodied waiter. Why are you throwing? That's it. That's how we're going to start this. Judy says no. Her husband is not surprised her in the kitchen because she didn't realize he was there because he was dressed in camouflage. That'd be what I'd be doing, Diddy. That'd be coming home completely dressed in camouflage and I'd stand behind a plant in a corner and say, can you see me? Because I'm classy like that. Change that, that line. So I'm not, as much as I'm putting in some of the, the rough details, I'm not doing them overly finished here because this isn't, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go over this page with ink. So, you know, We'll build up those elements as we go. But one of the things that I really do enjoy doing in order to, to allow an image to, to carry over from panel to panel. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, I see you. In order to allow a panel to, to, to carry over into the next one or to direct to the viewer across our page is that uh, oftentimes I like to have this you know, hands peeking into that next, that next frame. Just, just taking you over. You know, it's, it's a sort of, it's a subtle cue. It's like a subtle visual cue where it, it again, this is a, uh, something that's been done over the years. In the nineties, it was done to access. But, uh, where you'd just have a giant page of a guy running through the air and kicking, and then you'd have his foot going into one tiny little panel in the corner, as if to say, you know, there's the next panel. But it really is just a, a splash page. I tried to put some story in. Uh, <laughs> Tini says, holographic would be Gary's field. Ask him how that works. So with this uh, plan in mind, uh, I've, leave, I've left it out for now, but there's a border edge intended here. And then at the, the lower part of his body is also a border edge. So we don't have to get into too specific about uh, making sure that we've put in all of those elements as we go. We we'll just, we'll put that nice clean border frame in there in, uh, in the post and the edit, in the edit. Uh, Didi, I try to fit in, by the way, before we forget, if, uh, your idea about putting in the film, right? Um, the uh, the film segments uh, for the previous page of Courtney Saves the Day. And I, I, and I really like that reference to the Zapruder film. But rather than putting film uh, a, a strip of film or, or something of the like, because I've done that before on a page, I instead put the countdown up, five, four, three, you know, so that it, it intimates that there's uh, it's bringing you into that and referring to the found footage without doing so fake. And that's only because the story took an alternate direction and focused more on it being a time travel, time, uh, time situation. So, okay, so I'm going to throw in some of these background elements in here quickly, but I'm going to have, again, a cutoff point to the images as I put them in 
because I want that border to run down along here. So his hand feeds over into the next one. And it doesn't need to be overly specific and overly detailed because these are background elements, our focus. And the background elements are just to make sure that we have a continuance of that visual information playing through the panels, playing through the pages, but it doesn't disrupt us from our principal focus of the character or the scene or the whatever that we're putting it in. So, oh, there you go. That's a cool, that's a cool thing to put up. That's, uh, I always love those things. I call them the snapper. There's probably a real name for those. It's a clacker, Chris. Oh, oh, oh. That's what I that's what I meant. So I'm just playing uh, with some of the visual elements to populate the scene so that uh, it allows you know, the, a contextualization of the scenario so that you don't necessarily, if you can do a nice rough imp, uh, example in your first panel of the scenario that uh, your image takes place in, your story takes place in, you don't have to keep drawing it every time. So that's why I think, you know, it, you know, not to say it's scrimp on all the panels and every, every opportunity that you get to do so. Yes. <laughs> Can you hear him? Keeps tapping my shoulder. Hello. Did you know that I'm here? It's hard to be a cool guy when your cat's constantly asking to be a cameraman. Bearing in mind all the detail that you put into a page, you got to ink that. A clapperboard, also known as dumb slate, is a device used. <laughs> Thank you, Didi. <laughs> and now you know, kids, and knowing. Let's have the battle. I had to look at Didi, had to look that up. I'm glad I'm, that's such a specific example. Okay, so we've got some the backs of some of the chairs here. And then we've got, uh, so we're getting these various elements in. Pushing the depth a little bit with uh, with the image. And I'll do it just a couple of more here. Now he's around my feet. What are you doing? Stop it. You gotta love 70s rock, uh, principally for the fact that there's there's lyrics like, I gotta see a rock and roll doctor. <laughs> Kids don't know what they're missing. Yep, looked up. When is the movie starter clapper thing? <laughs> and it came right up. <laughs> movie starter clapper thing. Uh, the monster page that I did, I called uh, the Alice character, um, the which is played by Igor uh, in the Brady Bunch Universal page. I called him. Uh, I called him and her the magical helper, which is what 
those are the maids that always have the sage advice or the golf caddy or whatever it is. Magical helper meatloaf maker. So I completely understand movie starter clapper thing as a as a description. And sometimes when you understand what it means to have in a description, it makes it important that you understand what it is that you mean in the first place. The trick about doing a Brady page is not be Mike Brady for the next three days. I just, here's my expensive ruler. Throwing in some elements. Um, another thing that uh, that I'll do for myself for later, like generally I know if I draw at one point in time and then put it aside and ink it in one point in time, I generally have a, still have an idea where the blacks are, the black ink areas are. But uh, I'll do this sometimes and put these little axes in, and those are for the, the drop in blacks, right? And uh, but what that uh, What that sort of allows me to have is an understanding of the different elements. I intend this area specifically to be black. Got a curtain action going on there. That's the opening for the kitchen. What do you mean? It's a kitchen. I just want to add some depth to the composition. I just want to push, push the shape and and form around the the space of the uh, the waiter, so that it roots him into the environment. It sort of says. Here's the context for our narrative. This is taking place in this specific place, the specific environment, so that it helps to further, it helps to more uh, soundly establish that sound. Look at that, I have a ruler. Um, more firmly establish that this is in an Italian restaurant with all of its trappings, so. Yeah, I saw April wine once, and uh, I'm right up in front of the stage. And uh, Canadian rock band. That was one of the coolest shows I ever saw. I saw that when I was young. And uh, they like to rock. So I'm going to draw this arm to continue right off the page, and I'll make that decision as I as as I get closer to. Uh, to the presentation of the page, so. All right, so that's enough of that. Time to move on to the next part. You have to sit there and continue just to draw one specific environment for the entirety of the day. I'm just going to do an arc behind him. Change my mind halfway through. Uh, Duty's on most of the 70, 70s bands. Did you see the Come and Get Your Love? Did you see that band? I can't remember what they were called. Strangely, that's a band I would have liked to have seen.
It's a Christopher Walken dance bid for that. That's cool. All right, so good enough. Good enough for now. There we go. All right, so there's our. What are you talking about? Beat the fish on a pizza. Oh, please do, please do. So there's my first idea, and. Uh, So, okay. So, the idea being is that uh, so we're going to come at this character again. Once you've got them drawn once, you should have a general idea of how to go about drawing them again. And uh, the trick being is that think about the structure inside inside of their, their face, you know. They think about the way that uh, their shape of their head works, their eyes, so on and so forth. But, uh, okay. Thank you, Didi. So I'm just going to come at this guy again. I'm going to pull that hairline back a little bit, round that out there. That's how it would follow the, the shape of the skull. And then, because uh, this page is to continue with our character here, but at the same time, we're going to introduce a secondary character. So get that rounded tip to that nose because that's how it would actually be coming together here. Got to get that big, thick, swarthy mustache there. Swarthy? Swarthy? I'm going to turn the eyebrows down a little bit, thinking about that structure in the face. So as these eyebrows come down, the furrowed brow is going to change the landscape of the forehead. You know that if you scrunch your face up and then look at the lines that it presents on your face here and realize that there's this sort of plateauing that happens. Caveman forehead, right? And then the next thing, of course, would be the eyes squinting in a little bit. Let's get that big old mustache. How do now? What is it about mods? How how maybe somebody could, if you don't mind, Dee. What is a mod in the context of streaming? Like, what is a mod? I know that uh, you've got a mod. And um, I guess Frank is uh, Joshua Campbell's mod. What uh, what does that mean? Plan of the cheek. Lower that bottom lip. You can still see that peeking through underneath that mustachio. And it will raise this cheek up as he's talking. Um, someone, uh, I would put it here, only mods can post links. Someone that can kick bots out, mostly, post direct links, and trolls. Do you ever get trolled, Didi? I can't imagine that. And how do you go about choosing a mod? Does it need to be somebody that's, you know, how do you go about choosing a mod? Like, does that, uh, 
I'm sorry that you get that you get trolls, dude. That's that's surprising to me, but at the same time, you know what really surprises us anymore. So we'll give him that thick bottom part of his face. We've already started establishing these lines in here. Just one second, please. Nope, I just got uh, what you sent me there, Didi. Thank you. Okay. Somebody that won't Someone you trust, you don't want someone that will kick you out of your own channel. <laughs> oh my gosh. Is that a thing? Oh my heavens. I can't even. What? Yeah, so if it's a young young guy, don't, don't choose your girlfriend. I know you're madly in love today. Da 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 da. Bada bing, bada boom. Okay, so here's our waiter getting upset, barking at the camera now, barking at our viewer. I like to do pages where, you know, it's the intention is directed outward toward the audience, towards the reader. Frank mods for a lot of channels. Really? Everybody trusts Frank. Good stuff, Frank. But one day, Frank gets carried away, starts getting all twitchy because of his maple syrup addiction. A lot of people are in jeopardy. So it's looking at the first face that we did and carrying it over. There's, I'm debating right now. Uh, <laughs> Got to watch that syrup thing. Uh, I'm debating now whether or not I have them pointing at the camera. I, I wear my wedding ring on this finger right now because this weekend I'm getting it resized because uh, uh, it doesn't fit on this finger anymore. I've, I've lost a bit of weight, so which is a good thing. Whenever I start drawing the shape of a head before I focus instead on the expression, I always, you know, it's such a contrived way for me to go about it. I really have to have the habitual practiced way of just worrying about the elements and then the structure of the face comes together outside of it. You know, I really want to focus on those key points, the emotion or... Uh, just a sort of specific traits of that person's face. And I know that uh, the shape of the face is, is clearly a specific trait, but you know what I mean by the eyes or the, the expression, the, the intent, the feeling. This is that thing. I'm doing my best right now not to go. As I'm drawing. What are you drawing a nice guy? Huh? What are you doing over there? There we go. If you can just get those eyes to aim somewhere, it makes the rest of it all feel so much better as you're drawing a face. If you can just get that that focus there. So at this uh, art event that I went to last night, I got to talk for a moment about uh, the jam, the comic jam that I run each month. I think I might have some more people coming out. 
Very exciting. when Chris is focusing because he shuts up. Uh, Didi says, I find if you get the eyebrows and corners of the mouth correct, you can get that likeness. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Those are those key points in the face, you know, where you're finding those emotions, those key points in that face where you're finding, you know, whatever that that underlying expression is, a contempt, anger, you know, those those little micro micro expressive elements that are in here. And uh, I think it really helps to to make it far more effective. And capturing like the essence of the character. I like those uh, those lines. It's that uh, there's just something about that. I like those lines in the face that you know uh, different characters have, and <laughs> it looks like Corrupto. Yeah, this is Shimp. I'm drawing Shimp. Maybe I'll give them all the names of Groucho and Shrimp and the like. It looks like Kelsey Grammer now, that hairline. What seems to be the problem, Miles? Uh, there's few things that surprised me more in the history of film than the casting of Kelsey Grammer in an X-Men film as a guy covered in blue fur. Not for a moment would I have ever saw that coming. See, I'm doing it. I'm doing the. Outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend. Inside a book, it's too dark to read. <laughs> oh, inside a dog. Outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend. Inside a dog, it's too dark to read. Groucho quote. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's too dark to read when you're inside the book as well, especially if somebody's closed it or put it face down. Groucho jokes, George Byrne jokes, those are the best. Those are the best. Absolute fantastic one-liners that just, you know, like, you know, hey, George, you're almost 100 years old. When are you going to retire? And George Burns would say, well, I'd retire, but who's going to take care of my parents? You know, like, like, come on. Did you have ever told you my favorite George Burns joke? It's like the perfect George Burns. And when you do it, you end up doing a George Burns. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gary says, last night I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How I got in my pajamas, I'll never know. <laughs> That's Groucho, isn't it? Is that Groucho? Okay, my favorite George Burns joke is 
Uh, every morning I get up, I make myself some breakfast and a pot of coffee. I open up the obituary and I look for my name. My name's not in there. I eat my breakfast. I drink my coffee. I get on with my day. And then, of course, cigar. Right? Uh, if I wake up, I make my breakfast. I drink my pot. Of, uh, I make my pot of coffee. Open up the obituary. My name's in there. I'm still eating my breakfast. I'm still drinking my coffee. And I go anywhere on an empty stomach. That's my favorite George Burns joke. That and <laughs> I'm glad you like that. Um, that one and uh, I figure it as long as part of my body is working, I'm gonna stay in the business. You see this? You see this right here? I figure I got five more years. Um, I smoke, I smoke 13 to 18 cigars a day, but as long as I don't read the warnings on the packages, I'm fine because what you don't know about can't hurt you. It's, I could do George Barnes jokes all day. I, I don't know what it is about him, but when I was a kid, I just thought he was just the greatest. His appearance on the Muppets is one of the greatest appearances and one of the greatest interactions of uh, a live performer with puppets that I have ever seen. Um, he sings, I didn't want to do it with a, with a, with about five or six Muppets, including Gonzo. And uh, he leads him in a, in a song in the round. And the best part of it is Gonzo's trailing. Gonzo's always behind everybody else. You made me love you. I didn't want to do it. And then all the other Muppets go, I didn't want to do it. Do it. You hear Gonzo say, because he's just a little behind. Come on, kid. Stay with the group. You know, it's so, so good. It's a, in the, from the 1970s. This is from his appearance on the show. I never watched The Sopranos. I just, I, you know, just didn't get into it. Although I was intrigued by the fact that one of the guys from Bruce Springsteen's band was in the show. I saw his show. I watched, actually watched that guy's show that was on Netflix, but not the actual Sopranos. So you're going to round this, thinking about the, the planes in the shoulder. I'm going to round this shoulder out as I have uh, the other guy come up behind him. You got a problem there. So that the whole point of my page here is going to be all these Italian guys discussing uh, how much sacrilegious there there is putting an entire fish on top of pizza. I think of one of my all-time favorite co quotes. I use it on my girls. Beauty fades. Dumb as forever. <laughs> Judge Judy. That's fantastic. Yeah, that, that lady had some real singers. So get 
that piece of the bow tie in there. Let's try to carry over a couple of those elements. Round that neck out. There we go. It's coming together. They're, they are both very pretty. Hubster used to do things to keep them humble. Like one time when they were teens, had a bunch of friends over, and he went out to mow the lawn in plaid shorts. <laughs> Wingtip shoes and a sleeveless tee. I respect, I respect your Hubster so much for that move. He didn't want them being influenced by snooty friends. <laughs> That's fantastic. My oldest uh, wasn't attending her classes in the morning. Uh, she uh, now what I didn't quite realize is that my uh, my ex wife was having her babysit in the evenings for one of her friends, which uh, you know turned into all things. Anyways, but so I told my daughter, "You're going to school today, no matter what. You're going to your classes this morning." Bye, Dad. I'll go. And I'm like, are you going soon? So I said, you get yourself together. You see, and this is this is when single dads are nightmares. This has a single dad back then. Um, you get yourself together to go, or uh, I'm going to walk you to school in my house coat and pajamas. Mm hmm. Yep. Yes, I did. Right into the office. <laughs> Let me tell you how much the people in the office loved, loved that. As soon as I walk into my house coat, I went, hello, I'm here to sign in my tardy daughter. And she's just this tall, right? You ever going to be late for school again? It took one time. That's horrible. Horrible. That's terrible. Did I truly love my child because I emotionally scarred her in that way? <laughs> yeah, I uh, I had a friend introduce me one time to uh, this this lady that uh, he was dating, and uh, I have my terrible terrible person moments as everybody does, but I, I own them. I own up to them. Um, this, uh, I, I said, I, 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 my daughter was up to something and I said, James, stop doing it. What are you nuts? You know, and she goes, I don't know if yelling at a child is the way to do is the way to raise them. And I turned to my friend's uh, potential girlfriend and completely ended his chances of dating. Because it was the most dismissive way of responding to somebody's advice that doesn't have kids. And I just, she says, I don't know if you're yelling at your child. And I just turned and went, <laughs> and went on with what I was doing. It's just, it was terrible. What a terrible way to react. Parents, we got an idea of what we're doing. Yeah, we're doing our best. That's it. I said to my oldest, it's, it's, it's not trying to not ever make a mistake as a parent. It's uh, learning from them and not doing it again. I'm, I also used to distract one of my sons every because he's, you know, if he'd wipe out, you know, and he wiped out somewhat regularly and his coordination. It's not the best, but whenever he'd fall down and hit the ground, I'd say, what are you doing? You're breaking my, you just break my ground? As soon as he started, oh, right. What are you doing? Let me check. No, it's okay. You didn't, look it, it's fine. And I'd, I wouldn't check him, I'd check the ground. It's okay, you didn't hurt anything. <laughs> it's fine, look at the ground's fine. 
And you just look at the ground all confused. And, okay. And just get on with it. And you just want the acknowledgement of that you're that you're noticing that they're hurt. He's all right. He's 27. He's six foot two. All right. Uh, in coloring this, I've already decided that I want his his face to be going beet red. All right. So here's our guy. As he's explaining to this other fella coming up behind him. You know what this guy asked me? To put a whole fish on his pizza. A whole fish on his pizza? A whole fish on his pizza. Who is this guy? Yeah. That's when you're playing in a stereotype is when you're, you know. Hey, I'm on. Can I have fun with it? <laughs> it's kind of like Colonel Sanders. Chicken and pizza war? <laughs> There you go. You can have somebody go over react. What do you want to do next? But all chicken on night. Look at this. It's chicken on your pizza. You're happy now. You're happy now. You got to have fun with those things. Slap them with a large trout. <laughs> It's one of the best things in, in uh, Monty Python is that. Is that still a thing? Is that still a thing? When would it ever stop being a thing, Didi? You find a place where they don't do that anymore. You go to a different place. So I'll do this sometimes. I like doing this a lot, actually, is that if I've established an identifiable foreground scene, I'll come through after and then like the next panel and I'll just break it down to um, shapes, shapes and values. So it's it's. Uh, so it's still there, it's still in your image and all those elements are still provided, but because you've broken them down in a really basic way. What am I doing with this floor here? It just sort of lets you, because you've already established the scene and the shapes and stuff like that, it lets you just throw those in. And uh, and just this sort of rough geometric color values in the background. Because all that's going to be covered up in text, and especially with these two guys, because they're going to have a very involved, you know, back and forth about, he wants a what? He wants a fish. He wants a fish. You know. This guy. I like that. That's fun. I'm, I'm enjoying that. All right. I got an idea.
Actually, I should move that over a little bit. Trying to get that leisure suit look in there. Got to put that big uh, necklace. All the cliches. All the cliches. I'll do this for hands. I don't know if anybody else does this, but when I break hands in, I'll do it as a rough, a rough shape of the hand itself. So if I'm drawing a hand with that sort of a scoop, and for me, I think that this helps me find the hand and find the place for the fingers. And allows you to To structure that out a little bit more. So it's, I don't know. It's just a way that I think helps me figure out uh, some expression in the hands. What time are we at? We're at one seventeen. Let me. Uh, I'm just going to structure this page out a little bit here. That I'm with a drink. This is where he's going to lecture the viewer. My friend, you don't go into a pizza place and ask for fish. So that'll be the gist of this, this image here. How do sequential artists draw faces over and over and have them look like the same person? There's, that's a good question. Thank you for that, Didi. Um, there's twofold things, I think. One is there's an underlying tendency in any visual artist that you're when you're drawing other people's faces, because you know your own face better than anybody else's on the planet, there's always going to be an underlying continuous factor that has some reminiscence to your own expressions, your own the, the slight slight way your eyes move or your eyes arc on your face, shapes of your, your nose, your chin. And a good, uh, a person that does portraits, a good portrait will do their best to break that habit and focus entirely on the very specific structural elements of another person's face, right? Um, but most people, there's a continuity to how they see female and male faces and there's some degree of element of the way their own their own facial structure works in the characters that they draw so if you look at old pictures and the way to to, to defy that is to have a generic approach of this is the structure of a male face this is the structure of a female face and and then it becomes a lot of just continual reiteration of that face and and a way to 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 defy it always looking like you is you do it that way you break it down into that that generalized masculine and feminine face now that's a very limiting thing and it just becomes thicker and thinner faces and and then receding hairline like hair pushed back or hair you know the, it always looks like a highly stylized thing as different as characters look they still all look like this is how this person draws so if you look at um, even guys like Kirby, and Kirby had a real affinity for being able to, to draw different, different aesthetics on different characters. But at the same time, there's uh, a sense 
of masculine and feminine standard features on those. John Byrne is a prime example of that. George Perez is a, uh, there's a standard form. There's a standard body, body shape to how he draws. And, uh, and then it's just variations on volume and variation on, on uh, stretching perspective, like stretching the proportions of people. But uh, uh, everybody does it. Every, you know, everybody has some sort of tendency towards doing that. When as a, as a person doing portraits and as a person doing representations of other people, though, you want to defy that. You want to instead specifically try to draw that person. But what would help at the same time is if you can, if you have the facility to take a face, a, a drawing of a person face, uh, straight on. Let me grab a piece of paper. So okay, here's a weird one. Let's use this weird, weird uh faded green sheet that's fine okay so if you draw you know and you do your standard egg you know like this that's what these drawing books say draw a face and a, like an egg oh for heaven's sakes and then there's the section it down the center okay and now divide it into thirds okay and then divide those two sides those two halves into quarters so if you look at the thirds in this sort of a structured way, there's two different places that those those third lines sit. And that's right under here, and it's right there. So if if you know your eye, okay, so that's the start of your concavity of your eye socket. And then you know your eye is going to run underneath that. So there's your eyes. Now, side of the eye is stereotypically said to be side of the mouth. And then the inside of the eye socket is said to be the size of the uh, side of the nose. The nose would be placed halfway across between this line to this line is that that ball point at the tip of your nose. So when you look at the, the facial structure breaking down like this, and you have that general arc, this is where the lips arc up, that's where the lips arc across, and then this is the third line, it's right underneath here, a little bit off there, I think. So here's your third line across, and then there's your chin. And this is the shadow area under your chin. So when you break down your faces, and you do that for masculine, and you do that for feminine, we're talking specifically about sequential comic artist types, though, uh, Malcolm. I appreciate that's not how Picasso drew faces. He uh, he drew it only on one half. Anyways. Um, but when so when you look at the ear, side of the nose, side of the uh, side of the eye socket there's the ears generally on uh, on a face and so when you look at the breakdown of a face and so there's that plane there's that plane you know now that tells you if you divide this in a half there's your hairline so all of those sort of foundational rules that comic artists are taught this is the way to break down faces right and then it becomes variations on that uh yeah i draw the portraits just one face but you guys turn the faces uh, all which ways and it will still look like the same person how do you do that without using a personal reference well so because you have so that's the second part because you have this set of rules you can now take your egg and turn your egg <laughs> there we go gary you're not alone in that everybody's the same way so you can now take your egg okay and draw it from the side so if you take your egg and you take these rules and you take these principles and you just start moving those lines so that and then here's by the way is the the tip of the the, the bridge of the nose so when you start taking these different pieces of the face and you turn them across and turn them to the side now you're defining your character according to the same principle of of the, the it's the it's the same principle of of the front of the face it's just using a different slight, slightly different structured set of rules it's the same set of rules. It's just turned to the side. It's, it's literally taking those same lines and carrying them over. And so as a, as an artist, if you can sit down and practice that and start turning ahead, and that's why they're called turnarounds, then you're good to go. Then you'll be able to sit, sit down and figure out where the ear is going to be. 
If you divide the egg in half in this way, and then you quarter that egg, there's your ear. And so this sort of mathematical appraisal of how proportions work on a person's face. So a lot of comic artists will sit down and do these things along the way in their journey. And if they sit down and they do these things along the way in their journey, they're going to find out the different things that they need to find out for for following the contours of face and how how uh, how it it turns around. The real challenge is when you take your and and so you take the egg, okay, and now you've put it on this contrived shape. So here's your neck, here's your chin, but because you understand these same structural rules in the face, you can figure out where the cheek moves. You can figure out where the eyes are. You can figure out where the nose pops out. And so as the plane of the face turns around and you've got this guy getting knocked out here now, and you know his ear follows up here, and because the lines are bending around the egg, you can start drawing all these different parts to said face so that now you've got your guy getting getting tilted and his head, as it rolls back, you're still following the same the same principle lines it's just routine and repetition and as you turn the head around you know it works like that uh i see concepts artists work it's all amazing it's it's incredible how some people will look at it there's a really fine example of this it's jinja eat um uh not jinja ito i'm so terribly sorry uh kim Kim Young Gi, uh, yeah, the famous egg-shaped head in every book. Oh, thank you, Didi. I missed that. Don't make your palms sweat, Christopher. That's very nice of you. That's very nice of you. Um, if you look at Kim Young Gi, he would talk about taking this sort of rectangular box pattern, okay. And anytime he has to think about altering the course, if he's got this figure who's got his, you know, he's got his feet, he's got his. His, his legs, he's got his, his, his body, and he wants to draw said figure from a completely different angle. Well, he thinks about the structure of form, the underlying knowledge that he has in skeletal structure and how the body uh, is layered over top of that skeleton. And so he'll place that, so he can place that form inside this box. And he knows that in the structure of this box where the hips would be allocated, where the arm, the shoulder line would be allocated, because he's drawn this box repeatedly enough around these figures that he understands the allocation of space within said confined area. So in his head, he broke it down to an in his head thing from repeatedly drawing it over and over again in sketchbooks and on and on a dry erase board he had in his studio so he would think about if this is where the feet are placed and i've got his other foot placed this way let's say and so because i understand that about the anatomy now now i think about where that structure works inside of this environment and i figure out where the legs move and if i know that this is his shoulder line and it is hands down here and and so he would start to actually sit down and consider about where everything worked in relationship to to everything else and he would just foreshorten it it's it's there's tricks and trades that everybody develops over time and it's just a matter of finding whatever that is for you and and how you can clearly define it for yourself so that when you're drawing anybody and any contrivance and how they fit in this case sitting inside of a box you know it'll short step your thinking processes and it just becomes that that intuitive your hands going the way you were thinking about it yeah uh, young uh, kim young Gi could draw anything I, I i i firmly attest to that but the reason he could draw anything is that he would draw everything he would actually sit down and practice drawing the most inane things and uh and sitting down very specifically draw he probably drew every everything around him at least once some 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 pen some crayon some pencil sharpener some box some this some that and uh and you start uh, you start understanding the underlying principles the underlying structure and shape and form of all, all objects if y'all haven't seen if y'all there you go 
I haven't seen the book The Skillful Huntsman. It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, uh, uh, it's auto correct. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. It's a really good way of foreshortening the figure. That's that's true. But yeah, the skillful huntsman. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look into that book. I like the books. I like the books. Uh, it's an interesting idea to get people to try to look at different ways of, of uh, understanding how to break down the body in different dramatic ways and how to how to look at different perspectives of that. But like Philip says, the egg, the egg head, you know, the egg shaped head is something that's pretty much at the start of most how to draw the human body books. Draw, draw a certain kind of shape, draw an ovoid shape, draw this, draw that. Um, these, these structured rules for the shape and dynamics of the face, you know, there, there's these, uh, <laughs> TD says, I like the books too. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. We'll be looking at that book. It's a great, uh, great suggestion. Anytime that you, uh, you look at your, your face in a mirror, uh, there's, there's something that if you're drawing a lot of people, if you're drawing a lot of faces, if you're drawing a lot of anime and, uh, and, uh, anatomy, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's just repetition. It's just continual regular study and regular practice of just drawing forms. One thing that helps a lot, I always found, was just the simple, just the simple movement drawings. You know, when you're sitting down and you're figuring out the weights and and how a person's body moves, you know, and the way that they stand. And when you start doing these and you start figuring out how a body is moving around inside of a space. I found that these really help me out because then I understand the movement of a line and the movement of form. You know, uh, Philip says he still refers to the Bridgman books. Yeah. Yeah. Every, there's, there's, everybody has their methodology in place. Everybody has their, their way that they look at um, defining the form. You know, uh, Hogarth is a huge, Bridgman's a big one. Hogarth's a big one. Um, there's, uh, I, I find it that, you know, the, the Marvel way to draw is a challenging one because, um, I think that of all the Marvel material and I think of all the, and as great as Ramita senior who did the book is, I think of all the Marvel material and all the Marvel artists over the years, the really dynamic way to draw the dynamic, you know, the idea of dynamic tension, right? And Philip will know specifically what that is. Uh, the Marvel, how to draw the Marvel ways, rather, I find that a lot of the images in it rather static. So uh, a lot of this, as soon as you start figuring out how this framework works inside the body, and then you can get more complex as you go and start drawing the rib cage instead, and, you know, and where the, 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 the shoulder blades are and you start working out the you know so you start there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can draw this same form and and come to a better understanding of how the body works in correlation with itself and whatever that short step it is for people to do that whether it's just the face whether it's the entirety of the body because the face is no different um there's all kinds of things about drawing the body rotating on an axis so that the head is turned like this and you're trying to draw each of those, you know, stop there, one there, one there, one there, or looking up and looking down, you know, and trying to draw all those different, <laughs> this is a great time to tune into this and drawing all these different uh, directional appearances of the face. And then of course the, at that point, and this is where I think comic book artists take it to the next stage, and, and this is as close as I can get to the answer for this question is, as soon as you have a basic understanding of, of the underlying structure for uh, masculine, feminine faces, because there is a, 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 a fair difference, um, then you're going to, in that exploration, in that short language, no, this isn't sidetracking me at all. This, I'm going to finish this sucker anyways. This is fine. Uh, but uh, this is how long I usually go. And I usually tangent anyway, Steedy. So you didn't sidetrack me at all, by no means. Uh, I completely appreciate the question. Um, once you have done enough of this, 
once it, you have done enough of this, you are going to develop a short step language inside of your head so that you're going to, your characters are all going to be somewhat reminiscent of one another. And the reason for that is you have X amount of time to do pages. You have X amount of time to do books, right? You know, if you're working for somebody, then you've got to get those things done in a certain amount of time. And you do not have, you, the, the, the more and more you start working for a more professional publisher corporate structure, and the more and more that you have to output material in a shorter amount of time, you're always going to come up with the short steps to do it. And so you're, there's going to be a sort of generic structural style of looking at male and female faces. And if you look at any specific comic book artist, it's like, say, go through Instagram or go through Facebook. Well, I don't know Facebook. I really don't know anything about Facebook. How, how it, I, All I do is post to it and try to respond to people. I can't even figure out how to look at other people's posts unless they're in my feed. Um, Oh, yes, Philip, of course, of course it would be. Of course it would be. But this is something that after time becomes second nature, after time becomes an underlying principle because of that, because of your time at school, Philip. Uh, but it's something that other people have to figure out along the way. But I still think it's something that we need to regularly look back at and play with, play with these structures, play with these definitions of, of form and, and, and character function. Um, if you look at any comic book artist, if you grab a copy of their book, and uh, if you grab or you scroll through their Instagram feed or on the computer or whatever it is, whatever is most available to you to do, and you look at the way their faces work, and you look at the way that they generally draw male or female faces, you're going to find an underlying similarity to that. Can I show you a couple examples? Is that Will that help? And I'll tell you, I'll show you what I mean. Yeah, I'm wearing a blanket because I'm still not feeling great. I usually move like an old man after uh, after what I went through last night. So, okay, so I've got three examples, of, and these are artists that I I like. These are artists that I respect their work. So, by by no means. Am I going? Am I looking at this to dissemble what they do in any kind of a diminishing way? So, but I've got three, just three random examples that I pulled off of the shelf. Okay, jo, uh, Joelle Jones. She's an absolute wonderful uh, contemporary artist. She's she's uh, very strong work. And this is Lady Killer. This is her indie indie product that she worked on. Um, I didn't realize Laura Elred had uh, colored this. Or inked it. I'm not sure what she did. I'll have to look it up. Uh, that's uh, her husband is Michael Allred. Uh, the two of them together are, are responsible for Madman. Anyhow, okay, this is John Byrne. Now, even on the cover, when we look at these different faces, you see the similarity of structure in the faces, even Batman with his mask on? Like that, it becomes a shorthand. It becomes, a, a, and as much as Cyborg does look African-American as opposed to Caucasian-American, Superman. And, you know, Pa looks like an older guy and Ma looks like an older gal. Okay, so here is these older characters. And yet, the same structure, that same structure of face is still there. He's added some lines to it. He's defined the hair in a different way. He's defined shape of the jaw slightly different, but it's still principally this a standardized structure of looking at the form. You know, and so because of that, because he can turn that head all around in all kinds of different angles, um, he's going to be able to do that. He's going to be able to do these different expressions. And then we got the female face example. Okay. And so there's it. That's Lois Lane. That's Wonder Woman. There's an underlying standard facial face facial structure to the to the female characters as well. So even when he creates, let's see, there was a, I saw um, an alien. There's Sinestro. His Sinestro character is the same features. They're just stretched, right? But it's the same principle. So 
Uh, so here again, you see all these different faces, but they're all similar to some extent. Now, that's not to change take away from the fact that John Byrne is a very, very fantastic illustrator. Okay, this is Craig Tokini. He's uh, um, maybe I'm overpronouncing his name, and if I am, I apologize. Is this is this helping? Is this helping any this? Or am I just have I gone off the deep end at this point? If it's a if it's problematic, just please let me know. Right, okay, so uh, now Greg's way of drawing faces is his principal understanding, the underlying understanding of how male and female faces work, and then it just becomes. Uh, I realized I grab a book that has some adult pictures in it, so because sometimes characters get changed. Anyhow. Uh, so as he draws these different faces, and, it, and they're very stylized, okay, these are very stylized expressions, and these are very stylized towards how he illustrates, towards how he draws, and, uh, and yet, you know, there's some differentiation between this character, he's got far more volume, far more, far more weight in the face, there's a more rounded contour to him. And, but their underlying structure there, that thing that you can't help is there's some similarities in the nose structure. There's some similarity in the eyes. And that comes a lot from Greg Turkini looking in mirrors as he's drawing and seeing what those expressions look like on his face. And the standard way he has been drawing ladies comes through in the different female characters. The rest of it's all fantastic imagination and the leaps that he takes with so I've gone halfway through the book. I've got a number of different characters here. The same. Uh, I'll find another. Let me find a good one. This is a, a absolutely brilliant series, by the way. Um, here's okay. Here's a couple other characters. You can tell that uh, in these faces, there's a similarity to the way those faces are put together. You know, you can see it, that there's a, an understanding of what his own face looks like and how his own face moves as he moves it around and looks at himself in, in the mirror in different ways and draws it from that mirror that's over there. That's informing him about how other people's faces work. So, different, very different style. Similar underpinning. Joelle Jones. So, she has the same, develop the same shorthand. Now here's some diverse characters in her imagery. I chose terrible examples because lady killer is about a lady, you know, killer. Uh, okay, so here, see the structure of characters. She's looking at herself, right? She's looking at her own face and uh, she's seeing how her own face, her own figure, her own anatomy works. And she's coming to a really strong understanding of that. She's looking at aging that up, aging it down, the difference in proportion and, and, and body shapes, the size of the head to the, the slenderness of the arm. Uh, there's all kinds of wonderful things that are going on in, in the physicality of these female characters that she's illustrating. And there's a naturalism to the way she works. Um, always up for book flips. Of course, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. Oh, and I'm glad you're enjoying this, Philip. Yes, indeed, Gary. Jones has got some kind of line, right? The way that she, uh, there's uh, just a chunky exterior weight to the characters. And at the same time, she has this nice little, little bits and flicks, little textures that she puts throughout, throughout her page. And it's really nice. Okay, so if we move over here now, as much as this is a young looking lady, and as much as this is a lady with a few more years on her, you can see that um, there's a similar compositional structure to the face, okay? But what she's doing is she's evaluating the planes of the face in a different way. She knows that these planes exist on this younger woman's face, but she chooses to omit those lines or not 
not put them down in the first place, clearly, right? And that shows more youth in that face as opposed to more, more years on the character, more, more, more age in that face. The plane is the same here. The plane is the same here. These are the similarly, similarly structured faces. Different characters, different ages. There's a wonderful thing she does with the, the inking and that the hair here that just shows you that dramatic fall of, of long hair as it falls down and goes over the shoulder. I really, really enjoy that. So then that same kind of understanding of the breakdown of form and anatomy, she's got she's able to have these different characters reacting. Sorry about the glare on that. She's having these two different characters reacting in the physical fall apart, the physical move. Oh, uh, where are we? Let me catch up. Mark Davis, Philip says, nine, nine of the old men Disney animators was like that. You can always recognize his facial structures as animation. They're more cartoonish, but I think it's the same idea. You spend enough time looking at anybody's work, you're going to recognize similarity to facial structures. You can look at, uh, I'm terribly sorry, I can't remember his name right now, but he has a uh, Disney animator, worked on Lion King, draws an awful lot of wildlife on his uh, YouTube page. And he shows you how to draw all these big, big cats and lions and panthers and bears. And he has a similar underlying structure, an underlying understanding of structure of form for all of these different characters, like all these different animals that he draws. And yet at the same time, he has the facility to differentiate how they work. Um, structurally, the slight modifications for each one. Uh, I'm, let me see. Uh, Gary says, Back to Dee Dee's original question. I love Jones, but in Lady Killer, especially, you see the character's looks vary pretty wildly throughout. That has an awful lot to do. Again, thank you, Philip. It's Aaron Blaze I was referring to. Thank you. I appreciate that. He's fantastic. He really is. But you know, he has a, a structural understanding of of uh, of. Uh, <laughs> of form so with gary's statement here Didi's response is her palms probably sweat gary does anybody's palms actually sweat when they draw gary anyways um when you look at the the male faces there's a similar understanding of the skull the structural form there's a similarity in the uh older female as opposed to the older male it's it's a lot of repetition in drawing right but you're right, there is some variation in drawing these different characters and uh, throughout the course of any, any book, especially if you are doing a majority of that work yourself. You've got to expedite the time. You've got to expedite, expediate, I guess, would be, the, that's probably too scary. Um, expediate the way that uh, you you put to, uh, put together the characters faces and structures because you're, you're what you're more concerned about is the composition and the storytelling aspect or it should be right then you are about the specific line delineate uh, delineation for each character compositionally this this is rock solid but you know he looks younger in this panel and he looks let me get the text out of the way he looks younger in this panel than he does in this one. Now there's a glare. It's just, you know, it's that's how it's going to be that way, right? Philip says Blaze is so disgustingly good, <laughs> disgustingly good. I have to stop watching his stuff after a while or I get depressed. Oh my goodness, Philip. Well, you're comparing you're comparing yourself to him too much. See, this is the same guy. And again, completely different structure to the face as we have here. Clearly more time spent in this page than in this image, right? It's, uh, sorry, this image compared to this one, you can see what Gary's referring to. Real big structural changes from here to here. It's the same guy. Nobody's perfect, but at the same time, these are really fine examples of storytellers. I think that um, one of the things that's always impressed me about artists is that I'm I'm always far more interested in their facility for storytelling than I am in their facility for for flashy flashy drawings for uh, perfect 
perfect images and everything. Yeah, it's a hodgepodge. It's a choppy thing, right, Gary? Like, yeah, his hair, his hair did flip. It's a really choppy approach to it for sure. But I think that has a lot to do with being an independent creator and having next amount of time. And uh, the more corporate you are, there's a standardized, your characters have to look this way. And uh, the thing about costuming is that costuming makes it easier to make sure that you've got a standard approach to your characters because you've got to get that standardized, you know, uh, same costume every time. You can't have a change throughout. So I cannot understand for the life of me um, books where the character is constantly changing their outfit, but it's still the same illustrator. I, um, I, I just don't. I think it has an awful lot to do with the fact that the illustrator just can't do the repetitive costume, just can't stick to it. Uh, Didi says the colors keep a cohesive. They do. That's the, the beautiful part about color books is that you can fudge a, a few of the shortfalls that you have in your black and white work by linking things and tying them together with not just the color, but effects. Right, the flat, the more flashy it is, it sort of covers up for the, the 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 shortcomings that you might have in the in the penciling stages or the inking stages. Um, uh, what do we got here? The end of the day, she's amazing. I propose if I met her. <laughs> oh, there you go, Gary. <laughs> What if she spits on the floor when you meet her? Huh? What if she's a spitter? I am Gary. Will you marry me? Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's so many different examples of uh, of different uh, character types in that. Uh, but at the same time, there's there's that underlying principle that's there. So that's I think a, the way a lot of sequential artists have the facility to be able to draw somewhat reminiscent characters while turning their faces and their heads around but it's an awful lot of uh of uh heady arithmetic inside your noggin about uh thinking about all those parts in the face that are moving around or looking around there's real benefit to to staring at your own gob in the mirror and saying this is this is my understanding of a face is to the best of my ability um and how that adds to your ability to draw others because you understand so many of the underlying structural parts of, of your own face and how skin sits on the bone that uh, it, it allows you to see other people a little more clearly, right? Like, oh, Dee Dee got the drop. Look at that. Thanks for your perspective. Literally, she says. <laughs> I don't know if I... Uh, how good I am about repetitively drawing the same faces. I, I do my best, but uh, just as so, I think that, uh, you know, there's got to be some degree of le letting go of, making sure that everything about the character expression and character faces, if you're focused, Right, and I think Gary is really successful in this. Uh, for one example, Gary, um, in Gary's first book, the two characters driving in the car, and the conversation between the two of them, he has a really strong affinity for maintaining the integrity of these two characters' very specific and individual uh, appearances. It, it helps that they're very different physically. It really does. The one guy is, uh, you know, big broad bugger like me, and the other guy is more, is more gaunt or, or or far less heavy. And uh, but that's not the same thing of being able to draw thick and thin. It's it's the fact that he captures a hold of the the turn of the head. He captures a hold of the turn of the the face, blowing out of air at one point. Um, you know, and the conversational movement of the mouth. So he's clearly studying, right? It really helps that there's two completely different looking characters. 
and that he is and, and Gary has uh, expressed himself that he shoots source uh, source imagery and that's that's perfect why not there's no there's no rules and uh, people say you just draw from your head you do you let other people do that because I think it really works to work from uh, source imagery uh, to an extent and then you got to let it go at another point like you can you can pencil the entire thing and you have source around but when you're inking put it don't have your source there allow yourself to understand the the light and dark the values allow yourself to figure out the different approach with the ink and you're going to have a more fluid energetic line than if you're just copying pencils the same source so uh oh here he says gary's a good writer too makes a difference yeah no that's true that's very that's very true he's a great writer and the conversational aspect of that first book specifically second book as well no doubt but that really hit me when i read the first one and it's specifically because of the fact that there's a matching of the expression to the emotion and i think that that's that's storytelling it's not flashy flashy art it's not it's 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 really incredibly competent storytelling with good art it's not jumping out of panels and rob lifefield kicks in the in the whatever and the things and the what's uh you know that's why I don't like 90s comics, because it's far more about the palaver than it is about the core storytelling. Uh, so it's also because of personal bias, because I started reading comics in the 70s. Gary sucks the end of the story. Sure does. He sure does. Hey, there's that guy. You're welcome, pal. Josh made a good observation I hadn't thought about consciously and did have to consider. Since I don't use color, I have to make my characters very distinct. I just can't do this one's blue. Uh, okay, yes, but even if you do use color and this guy's blue and this guy's pink, it's it doesn't that that's not good enough. There's a there's a great deal of examples in comic books where characters are they all look uniformly the same, but they're just drawn, they're just colored with different colors, or they're clothed in different. Um, different costumes, different skins, but they still, there's just this absolute similarity from A to B to C to D. And in the 1970s, 80s, we had, uh, uh, for heaven's sakes, I want to say Kurt Swan. The guy that did Superman and Legion of Superheroes, you had George Perez, you had John Byrne, you had Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, you had uh, just bevy of incredibly competent storytellers, visually in comics, uh, to an extent that we don't see today. These guys were all specifically hired for storytelling capability, I would say, over the... Uh, the spit and polish everything looks exact i mean all of their stuff their perspectives there all the breakdowns are there the ramita the um john ramita senior eventually his own kid um cubert eventually his kids um gene colon very different gil kane very different all of these guys all of them are storytellers first polished pencilers second so there's a generic aesthetic and a lot of the faces that they draw there's a stylized male and female underlying structure of all their faces and yet at the same time every one of those guys are incredibly competent storytellers that that add some spin and polish on top of that but the underlying structure is on there oh uh, not to gary then definitely um the story makes the difference for me it should make the difference for everybody it really should but yeah i'm glad to hear you saying that dude one of my one of my gripes, one of them, one of my gripes, Gary says, about Alex Ross, who is super talented, for the record, is his men all look the same. Clark Kent is indistinguishable from Bruce Wayne. He just has glasses. Same model. It's the exact same model he uses for both those characters. The exact same. So he shoots the same photo source and he uses the same photo source to differ, to draw those two different characters. He shoots, like his father played Norman McKay in the Kingdom Come book. His his father was a, 
was a reverend and and looks exactly like the character that is our uh our guest i'll point the the character that we see in this world through his eyes that is hundreds of photos of his own dad and uh his superman model batman model hundreds of photos of the same guy so that's why the underlying similarity between the two is he's literally using the same picture for different paintings because how many pictures can you take uh it became challenging to him for using his model to do superman drawings from as his model because he'd been in, you know, alex has been in the industry for so long his model got older and as we get older we get heavier and our faces change i used to be very young and pretty and uh very you know th thinner features and and you know i've thickened up as i'm, I'm as i'm a, an older larger person and there's absolutely nothing wrong with those things we don't look like we did when we were 15. that's the beauty of life but at the same time, if you're leaning that heavily into your modeling, it's going to cause you problems. So because of their making of statues and action figures and models of his images from Kingdom Come, Earth X, right? They did busts, large, giant busts of some of these characters that uh, from these projects uh, based on I just started cracking up at Didi's comment. Um, based on Alex Ross's work in Kingdom Come and Marvels, and uh, and he is now able to facilitate the the uh, the appearance of all the Superman Batman drawings because he has that bust of the uh, the image he drew from the model that he used. So he's still going to have the similarity of that rather than use working from the model's images. Now he uses a, a statue. Everyone needs a Loomis course. Oh, well. Beauty fades. Dumb as forever. Gets a star. That's so true. Um, there's there's something fun about looking at very uh, certain artists. I wanted to make sure my kids read. I hear you. I hear you. I did the same. I, we actually have uh, all the classics in our house in two different... We have the classics. Uh and then we have all the children's versions of the classics that made made our forced our children to read Moby Dick and the like. We're terrible, terrible monster parents, but they need to understand good story and good structure. And uh, the uh, Northrop Fry, an educator out of Toronto, uh, Canada. Northrop Fry wrote the Educated Imagination, and one of the things that he says in it: the more that we consume of things, the the more that we imbibe literature the more that we you know it's any, it, it, it displays in anything um the more food the, the good food that we eat the more um any any pursuit okay the more we do of it the more sophisticated our taste the more sophisticated our value uh for those things becomes and i know people read a lot of stephen king and i'm i'm okay I'm not saying that people are less than because they only read Stephen King. I don't understand how you can only read Stephen King. I, I think that there's so much out there in the world to think. Of, I know one person that the only author that they read is Stephen King. And they got a library shelf in their house of just Stephen King books. And it's like, that's, he's a prolific writer, but at the same time, you haven't tried Peter Strobe? They're so close. You know, you haven't tried anybody else? Stephen King, man. He's tried some good, just stupid. And I'm like, uh huh. All right. Uh, yes. Um, I don't have a dining room. It's a library. <laughs> uh, did he quit reading King after Cujo? And nothing beats the stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His early stuff is fantastic. It really is. It truly is. Uh, and I don't care about how King feels about adaptations of his work. I don't care about it because the best examples of the adaptations made from his work uh, very clearly are made by the hand of the director and cinematographer. 
very clearly take a distinct approach according to that visual language of those two core individuals involved. And they're not just trying to do what Stephen King would want. His version of The Shining is disgust. It's stupid. Um, compared to what Kubrick did, and Kubrick took flight of fancy. Yes, he did. But, you know, there's so much more emotional impact in how he approaches it. Stan is definitely one of the best. That's for sure. Yeah, I truly agree with that. Uh, and I did like the television series that they made of The Stand in the 1990s and with Rob Lowe. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Sinise, Rob Lowe, uh, the guy that played Dauber on Coach. I can't remember his name. Uh, M-O-O-N, that spells moon. Yeah, I shouldn't have been doing an impression of that guy. I'm a little too close. Um, yeah, there's it's anything that you engage in, anything that you 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 read or you you uh you watch, you're gonna have like there's a there's a reason that not all the Star Wars films match up. There's just, there's a reason for that is that there's a, it's not a time and date thing. It's a, a stylistic level. Like it's a level of sophistication in, in the way the three directors did the, the first trilogy. And the, the force awakens is devoid of it. It hasn't got a clue about what it's trying to emulate and capture. It just doesn't. It, it's not as competent a director taking on the exact same material. And you can see the difference. So it's it's just a degree of sophistication. As, mu as much as new toys and new tools and new things come along, there's still something to be said for the foundations. And I think that, like Philip was talking about earlier, these core things that he learned in school, and going through those again and looking at and assessing these different uh, underlying principles is, is an incredibly, incredibly yeah, good thing to do. D says, the only movie I have seen that is as close to the book was The Godfather. Misery. Misery is uh, pretty darn close. Misery is uh, very, very close. Um it doesn't, it doesn't take an awful lot of leaps. One of my favorite things, by the way, about Misery is, uh, yeah, Annie and and the writer are, remember her name, but I don't remember his. Um, those sort of two are fantastic characters, and they're, they're who we spend 85% of the film with. But the sheriff and his wife, they steal that movie every time they appear. Every time those two actors appear in that in, in the film Misery, you are invested in them. There's just something about their emotional approach to acting. The Road has a pretty close movie version. No Country for Old Men as well. Well, there's certain authors like you know Cormac McCarthy that uh, he lays it all out. He lays it out. The emotional connection to the visual. All the, uh, the all you have to do to 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 adapt those is to to just round out and enhance that visual. But you, and he tells you the road has a bend that goes this way, so you're looking for a shot where the road bends this way, and the rest of it is all just building on whatever it is that you were thinking about. But the road is pretty much, if anything, the road is the film for me is scarier than the book. And the book is not a happy book, you know. Um, and then there's a little affectatious things, like as much as Though Country uh, for Old Men is a brilliant book, the way that the actor says, uh, friendo, <laughs> don't put that quarter away. Don't put that in your bucket. Yeah, there's just so, a different way in that guy portrays. Annie and Paul Sheldon, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, Paul Sheldon is his name. And, uh, and the name of the pig, anybody? Name of the pig in, uh, in uh, Misery? Named after the main uh, character in the books? Okay, you guys will be jealous, I think, because you know how you read some books or a series and then you can never go back to the newness of it? That's true, but in the second pass, you get a deeper understanding, right? So you're right, you lose the newness, but... Didi, 
has not watched the Harry Potter movies because you have not read the books yet. <laughs> I have a friend of mine I ran into last night at this event. He is actually the uh, person who sets up a uh, major gallery. He sets up all the displays for all the shows and oversees the maintenance of the gallery. And he's a really intelligent and really academic guy. And he's right now reading the Harry Potter books so that he can watch the films, Dee Dee. You're not alone. You're not alone in that. I, I think that's wonderful, and especially to come across two different people in 24 hours to say that. Oh, man, oh, man. Uh, oh, that will be fun for you. I really enjoyed a few of the movies. Some of the later films were really hitting the nose in the head. Some of those later films, I think around five, there's a there's a transitional change um, to the preciousness of adaptation into really getting into the meat of the emotion for me. That's just for me. I don't know about everybody else. I think out of the only movie... I've ever read the book version of is Jaws, a rare case where the movie really is better. Sells it, sells it so well in such strong portrayals. Yeah, uh, Gary read broad, uh, Jaws too. Yeah, I, I read Jaws at the same time as I read Orca. And that movie's a dumpster. That's a that's a garbage fire. My friend Janet couldn't stand it that I hadn't read them, so she bought me the whole treasure box set in hardback for my birthday. Well, now you got something to read. I think the first Harry Potter and Prisoner of Azkaban were my favorites. I don't know which one's a Prisoner of Azkaban. Isn't that number five? Or is that number four? Hard to beat Jaws as a movie. It sure is. I, I love the thing I love about Jaws, the mayor. Love the mayor in Jaws. That I think that if it wasn't for the mayor character in the film Jaws, uh truly tying in the desperateness of the situation. Uh, do you know any, does that make sense to anybody? Because the mayor, it's only about commerce. It's only about keeping his town running. It's only about keeping the sensationalism of it all down and keeping it, keeping the, keeping the gears a turning. He's far more concerned about that than the, than the shark. I just, I, it's a movie about a shark, and then one of the characters completely is disinterested in the shark taking over everything. It's a film about a shark. It's so great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, Azkaban's definitely the movie that introduced Gary Oldman, but I'm, I don't know if it's fourth or fifth, but you're right. That one's fantastic, and it has an awful lot to do with the performances of, uh, of Oldman and uh, who plays uh, uh, David Thewlis is fantastic in that as uh, the guy that turns into the the dog. Uh, well, I guess Oldman's the one that turns into a dog, but you know what I mean by the other guy. Uh, Didi says, I'm reading a 33-book series now, Sister Fatelma, sixth. <laughs> I'm on book 20. You're getting there. You're almost there. Uh, my wife is right now reading the Milford series, and I don't, again, that's another thing that has uh, uh, Lupin. Thank you, Gary. Uh, the the Milford series of books. There's quite a few of them, and uh, she's reading those. And she enjoys those very much. My wife's favorite uh, author is Maeve Binchy, uh, the Irish Irish writer. Um, like here's an interesting thing. Speaking of Irish writers, I don't know if you've read Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. It's a wonderful book. The film is very haunted. But uh, Lori got me Malachi McCourt's. Now oh, I'm coming up in a sec. Uh, Lori got me Malik, uh, Malachi McCourt's A Monk Laughing. That's Malachi's younger brother of, uh, of Frank McCourt. And uh, for as, as, as uh, incredibly popular as Frank McCourt's writing is, I like Malachi's more. It's just there's something about it that speaks to me. You, so you can never tell with, with writers what's going to hit with you and what's not. Didi likes British mysteries, murder mysteries. Yeah, 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 definitely get to that after the fact. I like the fact that the character is called Lupin, because I always associate the French uh, mystery detective with that, uh, with Lupin, and he's really about finding out the secret truths of the things that character in the Harry Potter world, so I just thought that was interesting. Uh, do you read so much history, too? You want to be an archaeologist? Well, that's kind of interesting, because that's follow suits with, uh, with me, because when I was a kid, I want to be a dinosaur. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's true, actually. <laughs> I want to be a dinosaur. Yeah, uh, I mostly read nonfiction, but I'll try to add 
and all fiction book selection next live stream. Nice. Did he only want to be one archaeologist? Uh, Philip's mom want to be an archaeologist as well. Nice. All right. Well, I got to wrap up. Uh, I'm over my time today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for very much. Uh, everybody for for joining in. I'll uh, sit down for an hour or so tonight and finish this fell up. But uh, yeah, it's been a really cool stream, and I really uh, appreciate your question, Didi, about uh, you know how to go about drawing all the different studies, you know, the different parts of the face and how it turns around. Uh, I I highly suggest to anybody that's uh, engaging in drawing specifically engaging in storytelling through drawing to sit down and to do turnarounds of oh penny's joined us hey penny sorry penny i'm just wrapping up towards the end but i'll be back tomorrow at two uh gary studied archaeology in college was switched to forensic physical anthropology about midway yeah and that's what you do now gary so i'm glad that's that's worked out uh yeah so thanks everybody uh it's been fun that's nice thank you uh next time yeah definitely um yeah, uh, back tomorrow with this page finished. And if anybody's got a one-page comic suggestion, Penny, if you have a one-page comic idea, let me know. Just put it in the comments below the video, and uh, and uh, I'll I'll write it up and draw it as I go. Uh, but I'll see everybody tomorrow. In the meantime, keep on creating, keep on drawing. Uh, I'm excited to see what you're doing. Okay, bye for now. Take care, gang. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Bye.